Okay folks, quick video designed to illustrate required practical 7 which is all about isolating pigments uh, in chloroplasts using chromatography. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, extract some uh, pigments from the leaves um, and this is going to involve a solvent so the goggles will go on and uh, you'll be given some plant leaves, typically spider plant leaves that look like this and they have veins that run in this direction and what we have to do to start with is we have to break open those cells and get the pigments out. So to do this we're going to use two glass slides, place the leaf on one and with the other one start mushing from above. And what you'll find is that you can hear the cells being mushed up, breaking apart and you'll get some green liquid coming out. Okay, So you might see that we're starting to get a bit of juice moving there. You don't have to press massively hard. Um, you'll get a bit of juice being produced there. And what we want to collect is not the solid material that I'm mushing up, it, it is the green liquid that's coming out. So in order to do this, we are going to need to wash that liquid and we are going to use a solvent to do this. Now the solvent is propanone, also known as acetone. Uh, it's highly flammable, it's quite volatile, so when we're not decanting it from the bottle, and put the lid back on. Okay, goggles on as I said when we're doing this. Uh, so take a pipette full of that and rinse the mushed up plant from the slide uh, into a watch glass which I have positioned here. So we can do a couple more of those just to get as much green stuff in as possible. And we're trying to avoid getting too much solid material in at this stage. So now what I've got, I've got a mushed up plant that we can discard. So put it back in here. We can put the lid back on the acetone. Uh, and I've now got a nice watch glass full of kind of greenish liquid. Okay, so the next phase is all about drying that out and driving off the solvent and the water. And in order to do that, we're going to use a hairdryer. Okay, so here we have a hairdryer, and of course, the temptation at this stage is to uh, point that as close as you can, turn it on full blast, but if you do that, you run the risk of your. Uh, your green liquid that you've worked so hard to get jumping out all over the desk. So it's better to start off up high, gradually bring it down um, until you're pretty sure that you're getting maximum airflow but you're not in any danger of blowing the liquid out of the watch glass. So let's try that. Okay folks, so after a few minutes of hair drying, you should have that green stuff completely dried out. Now, it's really important that you spend a bit of time making sure it is completely dry because you're not just driving off the acetone, you're also driving off water. Uh, and if you leave too much water in it, that's obviously that's a different solvent. That's going to interfere when we run the chromatography in the solvent. You, you want to get rid of the water as much as possible. So this is looking pretty dry now. and We've got a reasonable amount of green stuff in there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to prepare our thin layer that we're going to do the chromatography on. Um, so this is going to involve setting up a start line and a finish line. So the thin layer we're going to be using is actually um, a thin white layer of, of silica. It's actually bonded to a sheet of plastic. So this means that this strip has got two sides, a shiny smooth side that we're not going to do anything with and then the side with the, the silica on. And you need to be quite careful with it because it flakes off. And you also need to avoid gripping it with your fingers because there are oils in your fingertips that will get onto the thin layer and they'll interfere with uh, the running of the pigments. So we need to set it up, as I said, with a start and finish line. So I'm going to just draw a line across the bottom in pencil, one centimetre from the bottom, and then four and a half centimetres, or 45 millimetres if you prefer, from that, we're going to have our finish line. Okay. And that's now all set up to run our uh, pigments on. So a quick look. Okay, so what you can see, there's my uh, thin layer. And what we've got to do now is we've got to move our pigments from here onto there. So in order to do this, we are going to use a bit of capillary tube. Uh, and just a couple of drops of our solvent. Okay, so a capillary tube is a really thin bit of glass, it's got a tiny diameter uh, that will actually draw up any liquids that you spot it on. So what we're going to do is we're going to use just a tiny amount, maybe just a couple of drops of the acetone, put it back on our green uh, 
pigments that we isolated and using the capillary tube you can kind of chase that drop of liquid around and you'll actually see that it draws some green stuff up. Now I'm going to spot that onto the thin layer and you'll notice I'm doing a few spots. What I'm doing there is I'm layering up the green pigment. So I spot it, I wait for a minute or so for it to dry and then I spot another one on. And what that does is it builds up uh, a nice thick layer of pigments for us to run. I'm just going to loosen up a couple more. So one more drop of this stuff. There we go. The acetone. If you don't spot enough on, uh, you run the risk that when you come to run your pigments that they're on there but they're just a bit too faint and you won't see them. Whereas if you make sure you get quite a dense covering and you can be reasonably sure that you'll see it when it runs. Okay, so quite a big spot there. I haven't really given it long enough to dry between each one, but this is what it will kind of look like. This, this is pretty much what you're aiming for here. Right, now what we have to do, of course, is we have to get that into our chromatography solvent. It's really important when you do this, the chromatography solvent touches the bottom of the thin layer, but it doesn't touch the green dot. If it touches the green dot, it'll just dissolve it, it'll all rinse out the bottom, it'll fall off the bottom of your thin layer, and you'll get no results. So this bit involves a little bit of precision. Okay, here's our bottle with our chromatography solvent in it. And the chromatography solvent um, is a mixture of uh, propanone and petroleum ether. It's not very nice stuff. You probably would not want to be inhaling big lungfuls of it. So you're going to have to be careful that you keep the bung on and only take it off for the minimum amount of time. What you'll notice when you take the bung out, there's a slit cut inside the bung. That is so that you can fit your chromatography thin layer and it will hold it in position. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to slot that in like that. The bottom is touching the, uh, the thin layer, but it's not touching the pigments. That is going to be drawn up. That solvent is going to be drawn up by capillary action. It's going to start to dissolve my pigments and push them up uh, with a bit of separation, hopefully. So what we can do, let me put this back here so you can see it. I'm, I'm moving it very carefully. I'm, I'm trying not to pick it up and, and shake it around too much because I'll end up with an uneven solvent front and I may even end up washing my pigments out at the bottom there. But we're going to leave that. But that doesn't mean you can uh, just go have a snooze for a few minutes. You actually have to keep your eyes on it because you might be able to see that solvent front marching up the thin layer. You need to keep your eye on it. The second that solvent front reaches the line at the very top, that's when you have to take out your thin layer and, and end the process. If you don't catch it in time, the solvent front will keep on moving all the way up. It'll even go beyond the top of your thin layer. All of your pigments will end up squished up at the top and you won't be able to see them as separated out. So we're going to just leave that for a few moments now. Okay, so that is pretty much at the finish line now, so you've got to keep an eye on it. It's been, it's been approximately four minutes, but now what we have to do is we have to take that out so that it doesn't run any further. Okay, put that back on there, tidy some of these things up. Okay, so what's happened, if I bring it in for a closer look, you can hopefully see that instead of just one green splodge, we now have a whole range of different colour bands. This video is not particularly good at picking them all up. You can see three bands. There are actually more colours than that um, that you can see clearly. Uh, and those are now all ready um, to have the RF uh, value measured and calculated. So RF values are basically a, a measure of how far, as a proportion of the solvent front, those pigments have moved. So let me try and illustrate that by talking about this one here. Right, we know that the starting line was this point here. The solvent front has travelled all the way up to here. The pigments travel varying different distances. So if we were to take this pigment at the bottom here, if I measure how far it's travelled in millimetres, and if I then divide that by the total distance travelled by the solvent, I'll get the RF value. And that RF value is constant for that pigment. It shouldn't change. No matter who does the experiment, provided you're using the same solvent and the same surface, it will always move the same proportion. Okay, And that is required practical seven.